So the context for me starting the College Cryptocurrency Network was my first introduction with Bitcoin was when I read a Gawker article or Rolling Stone article about the Silk Road. And I learned how you, there's this internet currency and you can buy drugs with it off the internet. And I was like, well, that's fascinating. But I checked out the Silk Road, downloaded a tour. Was it wasn't that thrilled, never bought any Bitcoin. It sounded burdensome and difficult, so I didn't really take it particularly seriously. I ended up revisiting the technology about a year and a half later when it was about last October, last November, my friends were like, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. Price is about to shoot up. I was like, I never take my friends' investment advice, but I was like, sure, I'll, 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 I'll buy a little bit of Bitcoin. I had some uh, change to spend, and so I, I bought some Bitcoin. Sure enough, it went from 200 to $1,000 almost overnight. Cash out right then. I, I knew it was too good to be true. I was like, I wasn't one of those diehard Bitcoiners. So, you know, to me, I was like, wow, that is awesome. But I don't believe this can get any better. Pretty much, I had known Bitcoin to be good for two things. Buying drugs off the internet and as a speculative commodity. Which, if you think about it, isn't a particularly useful um, asset. Um, to put it in those terms. Um, it wasn't something that I was particularly interested in. And then I transferred to the University of Michigan last winter, where I just happened to move into the same apartment as a fellow named Kennard Hawkenhall, who had started the second Bitcoin exchange in the US. He had dropped out of the University of Michigan after discovering Bitcoin. He was originally from the inner city of Detroit, had been really disillusioned by the financial system. His uh, house had been foreclosed on as a teenager. And Bitcoin had made so much sense. So he dropped out of the University of Michigan, went into Adam Draper's Boost Accelerator, and started the second Bitcoin exchange in the US. It failed. He ended up moving back to Michigan. Same time I moved into this apartment, he was living in with his former fraternity brothers, who I just happened to live with. And they had never taken him seriously, even though he had convinced them to buy some Bitcoin at like five bucks a pop. Um, but, you know, they, they still didn't take the technology seriously and because I didn't know anyone at the school I humored him and I would speak to him after I'd done all my homework talk about Bitcoin learn learn about the technology and although he's like a hardcore anarchist which is the opposite of what I am uh, I was still pretty interested in this blockchain so I ended up started taking video courses on Bitcoin learning about what the blockchain was and I got interested and he encouraged me to join the Michigan Bitcoin Club, which his uh, friend from his fraternity, Danny Block, had started. First meeting I go to, there's a reporter from USA Today and she's asking about Bitcoin in our club. And of course, I can't talk about the club, but I've been learning enough about Bitcoin that I'm feeling somewhat confident enough to discuss the technology. She then mentions that, that there are Bitcoin clubs at MIT and Stanford. And now this picks my interest because I, at the time I had felt very disillusioned. For the past five years of my life, I had thought I wanted to go into politics. But after working in multiple political offices, helping run the campaign of a woman running for Attorney General of Massachusetts, it became very clear to me that our politi the American political system is really just so messed up right now that if I wanted to change the world, make it a better place, the political system was not how I was going to do it. And when she said there are these clubs at MIT and Stanford, I saw an opportunity. I asked for their contact information. Daniel and I, the, 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 the head of the Michigan Bitcoin Club, got on a call with the, those Bitcoin clubs that very night that we spoke to the reporter. And we spoke to them and Danny talked about their respective successes and failures. They were sharing ideas uh, present in presentations. And right then I was like, why don't we create an organization out of this so we can share resources, help other Bitcoin clubs get started. Didn't really know what I was getting into. I think at the time, I hardly understood what the blockchain was. In hindsight, I'd probably call this like the blockchain education product a project. But thus, the College Cryptocurrency Network was born. And well, about a month later. And as a result, it's kind of proliferated as this extraordinary grassroots effort, something that really, it, they, there's a saying, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, and I, I mean, the giant may just be Satoshi Nakamoto. It may be kind of 
the failed political era we're in right now, and maybe the financial system that's clearly broken. But Bitcoin clubs have since spread to every continent, to over 35 countries, and they're growing every single day. Um, the CCN has over 160 chapters and we're 10 months old. I mean, we have to be easily the fastest growing nonprofit in the world, one of the world's largest student organizations. And what's incredible about it is that it's so organic. You know, we have a little bit of funding from very generous sponsors, but at the end of the day, what happens at our schools, whether they're middle schools, high schools in rural China, PhD programs in Germany, it, it, it doesn't matter. It, what, what matters is that these students are passionate about this technology. They want to see it thrive because they know it's better than the system that we have today. And that's just throwing to uh, see. I, I take no credit for the success of this nonprofit. I mean, literally all I did was create a Google Drive, kind of compile these documents, and then spoke to students that wanted to create organizations. Now, I've even outsourced that to, to another student. And the, 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 the organization internally has gotten larger. Then the day, it's a, it, we're a fully decentralized organization. That's one thing we may be. We may be the largest decentralized organization in the world. While I'm executive director, each of our chapters have full autonomy over what they do because much in the way that Bitcoin works, that's how we believe a nonprofit organization should work. There doesn't need to be someone telling everyone what to do all the time, you know. There's some hierarchical decisions that need to be made and that's why I have my title and you know and that's why we have a board of directors to help make those big decisions but overall each each student group may, chooses their own course they chart their own path and that's really what we want to encourage as a result some of our uh, chapters are more active than others some of our chapters have been uh, published in academic publications writing about cryptocurrencies uh, others have uh, raised money for companies they come up with while in our chapters uh, I think Student, group, student companies coming out of our network have raised over $9 million in the past six months or so. Um, I, I only expect that to grow. And what I think we're seeing is the beginning of a movement that will bring Bitcoin and the blockchain to the masses. But as I spoke about earlier today, it's not there. It, it can often feel like it's there because once you get Bitcoin and get the blockchain, it becomes your life. It's the most fascinating and riveting technology in the world. It's revolutionary. You know it's going to change the world. But the problem is, is that it causes a lot of people to make mental le leaps that they shouldn't. It's like, oh, it makes sense to me now. How long did it actually take you to really understand Bitcoin? And once you realize that there's that hurdle, then you realize how important that, that grassroots evangelism is. Because, it's, because Bitcoin is not simple. And in order to make it simple, you need two things. You need people that are interested in it, but more importantly, developers and thinkers that are creating products that make it so you don't have to think about Bitcoin. Um, I say the, the day the blockchain and Bitcoin will be successful will be the day most people don't know they're using it. Um, it's just like the internet. We use the term TCIP all the time in Bitcoin because it's, it, it, it's a great framework for understanding this technology. You talk to the average Joe and they have no clue what TCIP is because, you know, it's, it is, it's the underlying architecture. And, that, and, and, and I think that's what Bitcoin will do best to serve as. I, I, I find it very unlikely that it will become the transactional concern, currency everyone wants it to. I mean, I think it may become something that you can use pretty easily, but volatility is going to be an issue in a system like this, and I don't, I don't see that being addressed anytime soon. Um, but that doesn't mean that much of the financial technology we use won't be built on the rails of the blockchain. I mean, the SEC or the FinCEN have all the reasons in the world to really develop and uh, use this technology for their own purposes because it's transparent. It's a fundamentally better system than we have today, but you know, there's a learning curve and you know, we just need to get there. And, and, and that's one, that's the message I try to get out there. It's like, if you really want to change the world with this technology, don't go talk to your parents who are middle class and give, they don't care about Bitcoin. It does, it, it's not going to affect their lives in any substantial way. 
go talk to your Haitian cab driver, the Egyptian immigrant at the smoke shop, and you know, you talk to them about Bitcoin, and they are gonna be so grateful that you introduce them to this technology, because every single week they go to Western Union or MoneyGram and they give. Let's say they only have $50 to spend, but keep in mind that the, the average individual lives on less than $2 a day. So I think it's 80% of people, maybe $10 a day, but it's not much. You can keep your family fed with $50 a week, very easily, um, in most of the world. Yet, mo mo MoneyGram and Western Union tend to have flat rate fees, which are reasonable if you're spending large amounts of money, but a $12 flat rate fee on a $50 wire transfer is 20% of the money you'd be spend sending to your family and a huge amount to your family. So Bitcoin does make sense to those people. So don't try, don't try to make Bitcoin make sense to the people it's not going to make sense to. Like My parents have no reason to like Bitcoin. This is really not going to affect their lives. But, but to the people that come from the developing world that have to participate in the remittance system, a $550 billion industry, those are the people that you're going to affect the most. Young people, too. I mean, we live in a globalized world. I mean, I think virtually everyone I know has more friends overseas than any of their parents do. Because we, we live in the age of Facebook. It's social media. It's so easy to connect with people that you've never met before. And Bitcoin has the opportunity to really affect those sorts of relationships. But we, have to, we can't think of Bitcoin in any sort of traditional sense. Even the TCIP, the internet, connection it, it's weak it, it, you have to think of Bitcoin as a revolution as a movement as something that needs to take place on the ground that's really what the CCN is trying to achieve it's something I've seen begin to take hold but like I said we're just getting there we're just at the very beginning it's we're, we're not going to the moon yet if we do I'd be very scared because you know there isn't enough understanding of this technology there aren't enough products that people are actually using to push the price higher than it is. I think $200, $300 for Bitcoin sounds perfectly reasonable to me, considering most people I talk to, I have to spend at least five minutes explaining it to, most of whom wouldn't care. So, you know, this, this technology takes time to grow, and I think its growth so far has been extraordinary, but the real work has, is yet to come. Um, so I'm running a startup company, Rivets. We are building for the first time the hardware security controls so that you can have hardware protection in your Android and PCs for your Bitcoin private keys.